So today we're talking about actors. Uh, to be confused with the actor node, which is a, a little thing in Enzo for doing physics. The actor is a Python class defined in direct that uh, implements all of our animation type things. Um, the actor class itself is actually a relatively thin wrapper on top of the very low level stuff in Panda, which is all implemented in C. Uh, the fundamental thing that handles this in Panda is a class called character. Uh, which inherits from Panda Node and is what you'll actually see in the scene graph when you look at an actor. Um, the actor class itself inherits from Node Path, which is a little bit confusing sometimes. Um, but the idea is that uh, you do most of your inter interaction with the Node Path, so it's kind of handy to have actor be a Node Path. You can do actor.play and also actor.set pause. It's all the same thing. Um, so, when you look at an actor, you've got a, so you did a actor. Uh, copy for actor construct and you actor model or you pass a uh, whatever it is, a list also constructor, and you got your actor. Uh, you can think of it just as an atomic thing, never looking deeper. Um, but because it is a node path, you can do actor.ls and uh, list the nodes that are inside the actor. Um, depending on how complicated your actor is, uh, you may see one or more nodes. In particular, you'll, you'll certainly see at least a character. As I just mentioned, the character is the fundamental uh, little implementation of an actor. And you'll probably see, presumably, if you expect to see any uh, geometry associated with the actor, you'll probably see one of the geometries in your actor. Um, just like anything else in Panda, when you something rendered, there's finally a geometry involved here because the geometry is what keeps all the vertices and the uh, polygons that make up the uh, geometry you're looking at. Um, in this case, the geometry uh, underneath the character has some internal structures that reference to the character object itself that uh, update the vertices when the character animates. Um, other than that, it's not really that different from any other kind of geometry. Um, you may see multiple geom nodes, uh, depending on the kind of uh, uh, structures you've got under here. Typically, you only see one, though, um, because uh, Panda tries hard to collapse uh, the character into a single geom node when it loads. This is different from loading up a, well, a character comes from an egg file. Uh, if you just load up an egg file with a dark flag in it, you're going to get a character. And uh, when Panda loads up that egg file with a dark flag, it tries to optimize it into as few geometries as possible. This is different from a standard egg file, which is used for uh, static geometry, like for environments or props, without the dark flag. When you load up one of those, uh, Panda will create a different node for each inch group node in your egg file and tends to have a fairly deep structure. How do you um, specify the dark flag? Dark flag, uh, so I'm glossing over that bit, but the main difference between an animated egg file and a static egg file is a table of joint hierarchy and uh, vertex assignment to those joints and the dark flag at the top. That all comes out of the exporter. My to egg uh, has different options to it according to whether you want to opt uh, export as an animated character or as a static character. Uh, and as my to egg puts in that dark flag or not puts in the dark flag. Okay. Um, also, of course, if you're using soft or 3D Max or whatever it is, all these converters are responsible for putting in the dark flag or not putting in according to the parameters that you use. Uh, but it is a dark flag that is the top little thing that says uh, this will be an animated object. And the reason it's called dart is lost in the mists of time. <laughs> uh, we had one of our early uh, engineers um, called it dart because it was... Uh, uh, he had some acronym, I forget what it was. But uh, anyway, he likes saying it was an object dart. You know, it's an object of. Ah. Uh. <laughs> anyway, it now it's just a dart. Um, uh, but uh, let's see. Uh, according to all of the different kinds of uh, levels of complexity inside your actor, you may, in fact, see multiple levels of uh, characters if you have a multiple multi part actor. And I'll talk about those later. And each character would have its own geom node. And you may even have an LED node at the top. LED node, if I could write that properly. Uh, if you have an LED in your character, and I'll talk about that too. Um, but fundamentally, when you do an actor.ls, you'll see just at least that. Um, now, uh, inside the character, internal to the character node itself is a hierarchy of joints. Fundamentally, an actor or a character is a hierarchy of joints because this is skeleton morph animation and the joint hierarchy represents the skeleton of the actor. This, this particular skeleton is defined by the artist who originally, originally modeled the actor. This is the rigging of the actor. Um, and I described in a past lecture about four years ago uh, 
how the egg file is structured that contains this joint hierarchy. You can go look that up if you want. That hasn't changed in the past four years, so I won't bother to go over that again. Um, the structure of the character and its geometry has changed a little bit, so I'll talk more about that. Um, inside a character, internal to the character, uh, is uh, fundamentally there is at least a bundle, uh, a part bundle. That's the root of the joint hierarchy. Um, and uh, in fact, a character is the. Uh, I said character inherits from panda node. Actually, it inherits from panda node by way of a subclass called part bundle node. Um, and the only other thing that inherits from part bundle node. Well, character is the only thing that inherits from part bundle node. So we could have collapsed those two classes together, but for various reasons we didn't. But a character basically is a panda node that can contain part bundles. Um, so you can call character dot get or character dot get bundle. Um, and there might be multiple part bundles, but typically there's only one, uh, and that would be the first one that you store there. And I'll talk about multiple part bundles also later. That's a more complex thing. But your part bundle is the root of the joint hierarchy. Uh, you, you can traverse it similar to the way you traverse the node hierarchy, but it's not a node in itself. Part bundle does not inherit from panda node. Uh, just like geom is not really a, uh, a type of node. A geom is something that's stored inside a geom node. You can think of a part bundle the same way. A part bundle is something that's stored inside of a character. Um, <clears throat> normally there's no need for you to look inside the part bundle. But if you were the curious type, or if you really want to get down and dirty with the internals of Panda, you would, you can walk recursively through the part bundle, uh, because uh, you can call get num children, I think it is, and get child, get child i, which returns the ith child. So you can use these two methods to iterate through the children of the part bundle. And for each child, you can do this again and recursively iterate through the entire hierarchy. Some of the children of the part bundle you'll find will be of type character join. And a character joint is a skeletal joint of the character. Uh, basically, a character joint stores a matrix, a transform. Uh, and every frame as a character animates, the, joint, the joint's transform will, uh, will change according to whatever the animation says. Um, You'll also find a character slider, or a number of character sliders, perhaps. A slider contains only a floating point number, which typically varies between 0 and 1. Um, and this controls the morph targets of the character. Uh, nowadays, morphs are kind of out of favor. Uh, we typically do most of our animation via joint animation. But it's really up to the artist uh, who designs the characters. Sliders tend to be used for facial animation. Um, you can use a uh, morph to, uh, to change the vertices around without being uh, controlled by a particular joint. Um, typically what you do is you would have, you design a bunch of faces, one with a good big smile, one with a frowny face, one with a neutral smile, uh, and then you'd have your open mouth. And you could use all these as different morphs, and by changing the sliders back and forth you can make your mouth do funny things. Um, but uh, uh, that's, uh, that's a more esoteric topic. Um, I think in Pirates we strictly use joints. I don't think we have sliders at all. Um, in Toontown we don't have sliders. We use joints with base nuts, so we used to use sliders. Yeah, we did experiment with with first uh, for the joint. Yeah, we switched over a year or two ago. Yeah. Um, Panda can handle either one. Uh, it's up to the artist. There are, some, there are some technical reasons to prefer joint server sliders too. Uh, if you want to do uh, animation in the GPU, it's simply easier to do it with joints because it's just one algorithm. You don't have to have two algorithms like a GPU program. Uh, anyway, um, but as far as Panda is concerned, this is just a hierarchy of joints and sliders. Um, and uh, every joint stores a matrix, every slider stores a floating point number. And um, uh, then, well, that's basically inside part bundle. This is, and there'll be a, a long hierarchy of these things. Yes? Uh, well, if you get child zero on the first part bundle, on the base part bundle, you can uh, print that out and it'll just highlight the list of all joints. Model. It won't work from the base bundle, but if you do get shell lines to the skeleton. Oh, that's handy. That. Okay, so there you go. Get shell print, don't part bundle get shell zero. I, did, I guess the, the it's, it's not inherited. Yeah, the, the base class doesn't have it or something. But the yeah, it's probably some error We should probably add that to the oh, yeah. part bundle. But there, there's also acted up list joint, which is handy. This basically does that cursive walk and prints out everything it finds. Uh, so if you just want to see what's inside your actor, this is a good to do it. Uh, for that matter, if you've got an egg file, 
uh, Eggchar do this for you too. Egg opchar dash ls uh, model.egg. A handy thing about two. Uh, okay. So that's all well good. Um, now let me see. Oh yeah. So this is this is the structure inside part bundle that represents the joint hierarchy of the uh, of the character. Uh, there is when we look at an animation, it will be a similar uh, structure, uh, a parallel structure of uh, anim bundles, which is the root of the animation hierarchy. If you load up a uh, an animation egg file, uh, it will the first node will be I think it's an anim bundle node uh, matches a part bundle. Then you can call dot get anim get bundle. Yeah, same get bundle. Uh, get bundle on the bundle. Multiple actions. Yeah. Um, anyway, the same trick. Add a bundle. Get number and get child. And you'll add, iterate through recursively through this guy, and you'll find um, a bunch of things which would be, and particularly, a, there is a kind of m-channel matrix. What you will actually find is a, a more specific subclass, which I think would be m channel matrix XFM or something like that, which refers to the particular way that the matrix is stored in memory. This is a fundamental uh, base class that indicates I store image every frame. And there's also an atom channel slider. Which stores a floating point number for every frame. Um, and this hierarchy should exactly match your hierarchy of parts. Um, now this is a table of numbers, fundamentally. It's a table of joint uh, animation poses per frame and uh, slider uh, poses per frame. So basically at one matrix per frame of your engine per joint. Um, this is basically a static table, so you can reuse the same bundle for multiple different characters, but every different character you've got on the screen, of course, is going to have a different hierarchy of bundles because these things are changing every frame. Uh, now, when you, let me get some space in the middle here, there's an operation called binding, which is the association of the anim bundle to the part bundle, and all of its corresponding hierarchy gets associated one to one. Uh, this is an internal function inside actor. Uh, if you're using the C interface, you have to bind explicitly, but if you're using actor, this happens automatically when you play animation. Um, and it's going to recursively walk through your entire joint hierarchy and, and in parallel walk through the anim bundle hierarchy and associate each of the two of these. And when all these get associated, the result gets stored in an anim control. And anim control is a low level panda uh, class, which again, you hardly ever need to use if you've got your actor. But uh, you can use it. It's, it's convenient. It has all the play controls on it. You can do play, stop, rewind, whatever you got on your uh, uh, animation. Uh, anything you can do to control an animation, you use the anim, anim control for. In fact, we call it dot play. What it's really doing is getting the anim control and come play on that. Um, <coughs> now, there is a anim control created for each binding of animation to part. Um, so if you have multiple animations on your character and you switch between them, you're creating different anim controls for each time you switch a new animation. And those anim controls get stored in the character uh, in, in, until you want to use it again. Um, <coughs> let's see. There's, uh, you can think of the anim control as being something that plays and actually is doing work. In fact, when you call anim control dot play, uh, if you ever parent your actor into the scene, uh, if you take him out of the render and never touch him again, the anim control isn't actually doing anything. Next time he gets rendered, he looks at the time elapsed since the last time he was rendered and recomputes vertices accordingly. Um, so it's kind of a passive play. So there's not really any cost to calling an anim, anim control. The cost is actually in rendering the animated character. But it's an important distinction. Uh, also, the main reason you want to use anim control at a high level is as a performance optimization. Um, uh, for instance, the actor interval uses anim controls because it's faster to call uh, anim control dot pose than to call actor dot pose. And that's because when you call actor dot pose, it's got to go hunt around on those tables and find anim control people and just call pose on that. If you go straight to the anim control, you save a few steps. Um, but for the most part, you don't have to think about that too much. Let's see. OK, let me talk a little bit about uh, the geometry inside the actor. So uh, now we know that the actor has a character, and the character has a part bundle, and the part bundle internally has a hierarchy points. When you load up an animation with the actor and call play, it's associating the anim bundle with the uh, part bundle, and you've got a table joint now animating in the sense that every frame you can ask what joint, you can ask each joint what its matrix is, but that's all it's doing. If you actually want to animate the character to make the geometry do stuff, uh, that means you need to push the vertices around. 
So remember when we said if you do your actor.ls, you got a character, and then underneath you have one or more geometries. Inside geometry, we have geometry. This is what Panda does. Uh, so that means we might have one geom or more, and each geom has a um, vertex here. The geom vertex data, of course, is a structure inside Panda towards uh, vertices. So, now in the inside of actor, well, if you're just looking at a static model, the geom vertex data is just a table of vertices. Every time you enter it, it's always the same thing. It renders those vertices in the card. If you've got an animated geom vertex data that was created by a egg file with a flag, it's set up with special pointers that go back in the table of part numbers. Um, in fact, you, uh, if you look at the uh, Format, John Vertex format, which is associated with some vertex data. You'll see a couple of things that are unusual about it. Uh, one is it's got a atom spec, John Vertex atom, atom spec. You can ask the format get animation spec. That just says uh, it's basically it's going to say it's animated. It's, it's a, there's an enumerated value which is either not animated or it's called AT none or AT panda or AT hardware. Um, typically, you will see AT underscore Panda, uh, which means it will be animated by Panda on the CPU. Uh, there's another option which you will occasionally see, uh, which is not too terribly likely, AT underscore Hardware, which means the vertices will not be animated by Panda, but they'll be passed to the GPU to do the animation. Um, we don't use this too often because uh, this relies on an OpenGL or DirectX extension which frankly is not very uh, powerful. It was designed back in the days when actors and characters did not do a lot of uh, vertex animation, uh, and it can only handle very limited kinds of animation, which are not sophisticated enough for modern needs. And in principle, uh, you can write a hardware shader that will do the kinds of animation that we do today. Uh, we haven't yet integrated that level of uh, shaders with Panda, so it's either on the CPU or it's on the GPU using existing extensions, which are not that powerful. Maybe one day we'll integrate that. There hasn't been an overwhelming need for it. Um, so most of the time you see AT Panda in the uh, animation spec. Now, the other thing that you'll see is there are a few new columns uh, in, the, uh, in the format, uh, which uh, tie together each vertex with an entry into the transform blend table, which is associated in the jump vertex table also. So the John vertex data, an animated vertex data, has a, has a pointer to a transform blend table, which is a table of uh, weights of each joint to each vertex. Uh, and so for every different unique combination of joints that might contribute to a vertex, there's an entry in, in the blend table. And one of the columns in the vertex format shows an integer number which indexes into that table. So this is how we index each vertex in the data into the table of joint vertices. So every particular vertex might be influenced by one or more joints in the uh, joint bundle. Remember, we had a whole big hierarchy of joints. Every one of them has a matrix, and that matrix changes every frame. Multiple, multiple of those joints might contribute to the placement of one vertex. So we store for every particular combination of joints that might influence one particular vertex, that is, for instance, suppose you have 50% of joint A, 25% of joint B, and 25% of joint C. That's one particular combination. For every vertex that has that particular combination of weighting, uh, we have a, an index into that same position in the transform blend table. So the, the transform blend table might have many hundreds of entries in it, according to how many different joints we've got and the relative combinations each joint contributes to the different vertices. Um, that means when we animate the character, we have to compute all of those different weight combinations, which is basically uh, computing each of the joints and then multiplying the matrices together by the appropriate weights, and that comes up with a new matrix. So that means when we render a geom vertex data that has an animation applied to it, uh, it will go through each vertex. Well, first it will compute all the transform blend table for the particular current frame. Then it will go through each vertex and look up its current uh, corresponding matrix in the blend table and apply that matrix to the vertex and, pre and compute a new vertex position for that, uh, that vertex. Um, there is a method on vertex data called animate vertices. Vertices. Now Panda 
calls this method for you automatically when you're rendering. Um, but this is the internal method, and you can call it from Python. When you get to a jam vertex data, call animate vertices. And this will do that work. And the return value is a new VDDA, the vertex data. This new vertex data that it returns is a static geom vertex data that doesn't have any of this animation table. It just has all the vertices in the new position. Uh, somebody actually asked me uh, last week, uh, what's a good way to bake out a BAM file that contains just a posed character without uh, any uh, animation in it? And they discovered that if you load up an actor and pose it and try to save it to a BAM file, what you get is the actor in its original position because it doesn't save out the animation. But uh, I advised uh, the guy, this guy who wanted to bake out the posed actor just uh, set your animation, pose it, and then walk through the scene graph, find all the geom vertex datas, and for each one call vdata animate vertices and store that back on the geom. Because this will animate the vertex, animate the data in its current pose, return a new static animation, and when you save that out to the BAM file, you get your posed actor. Um, that's about the only reason you'd ever want to call this. Um, but it's good to know that this function exists. Uh, animate vertices is actually cached. If you call it twice in one frame, the second time it returns the same value. Uh, that's how, if you have two actors uh, that happen to be playing the, uh, the same animation and they're in the same frame in sync, and they happen to be sharing John vertex data, which is likely if you did an actor.copy to get one of them, um, it's actually much faster uh, than if you had two unrelated actors together. Uh, it also means uh, if you're not using uh, frame blending, if your animation only changes every 24th of a second, which is common if you have 24 frames per second animation. Um, and if your frame rate is faster than 24 frames per second, you might render multiple frames of the same animation. So that because this is cached, uh, that saves some time too. Okay, is everybody with me? All right, so that's how we tie together the John Vertex data to the part bundle. Um, inside the John Vertex data itself, there's a transform blend table, and that transform blend table actually has pointers into uh, the part bundle, which is stored <coughs> inside the character. That means if you take your geom node and reparent it somewhere else, it's still going to be slave to this character that it was originally parented to. There are actually white port back pointers inside the vertex data to stuff inside this character. It doesn't really matter where it's parented in the scene graph. However, it's usually a good idea to keep it parented under the character because it's important that the character compute its transform blend table before you render the geom node. Uh, that's why the character's on top. Because as Panda traverses, it visits the character node first, and then it visits the geom node. If you parent the geom node outside a bunch of character, I'm not sure what you're going to get. It might work, it might not. OK. <coughs> There is um, one minor detail. In the transform blend table, what it actually stores is a table of what's called a uh, vertex, uh, vertex transform objects. This is a minor detail that's kind of worth pointing out because it's not actually storing uh, pointers directly to the part bundles, the character joints. What it's storing is a set of vertex transform. Uh, and there's a subclass of vertex transform which is called the joint vertex transform. And a joint vertex transform is one that actually has a pointer to the character. But there are other kinds of subclasses of vertex transform. Uh, for instance, there's a node vertex transform which doesn't go back to a character but just looks at the transform on the node, the panda node. Um, and you could use that to store any kind of arbitrary uh, animation on a, uh, a vertex. The point being that uh, this system for animating the vertices doesn't actually depend on the whole character system. Uh, it can be uh, uh, replaced with a, uh, a, a way to get vertices, to get uh, matrices from some other point. Uh, and I'll talk about that a little bit later if we have time. Um, okay. Um, I'm going pretty fast. Is this making sense? Mm -hmm. Feeling okay? All right. Back to the high level. Um, <clears throat> actually, let me put this back into your character. 
a geom node. This is the simplest kind of actor. We have our actor node, which is probably just a panda node up here. We might call experience joint on the actor to get a joint that we can manipulate or that we can see. Uh, and when that happens, uh, it's going to create a one or more panda nodes down here. It might be model nodes, I'm not entirely sure, but it basically it's going to be some kind of uh, ordinary node. Um, <laughs> each time we call expose joint, it's going to create a new node under the character class. Just a panda node? Just a panda node? Yeah. Um, and fundamentally, uh, if you call expose joint, it actually goes down to a low level class. It gets, gets down to the character joint type within the park bundle. Remember those joints again? And on the joint, it calls uh, add net transform. So when you, if you, you can actually look at the code for um, exposed joint. It's basically doing this. It's creating a panda node, parenting it to the character, and then it calls joint dot add net transform. Is that the character joint effect? No, <coughs> but that's a good question. It puts a character joint effect there too, uh, but that has nothing to do with the transform. I'll talk about what that does in a second. Um, the, the magic that uh, causes the joint to actually be exposed is joint dot add net transform which tells the joint every frame, every time you update your transform, copy it, copy the net transform from you, from the root of the uh, hierarchy down to this particular joint, and apply that to the specified node, uh, which is what we pass in here. Um, and that would work without the character joint effect, but the actor also puts a character joint effect on there too. Uh, the character joint effect is applied to the panda node, and that has a pointer back to the character. And the reason this is here is uh, it tells the panda node anytime you compute the uh, the matrix, anytime you get the transform, if you call node .get trans transform on this panda node, if it uh, the character joint effect uh, tells it to go back to the character and make sure that all of its joints are computed correctly for this frame. Uh, that's just a workaround for if you happen to have a pointer to your deeply nested node uh, and you want to get its transform, uh, its current transform, this frame but maybe the frame hasn't rendered yet, uh, this will force the character to uh, update its joints right now. Or you could put it way up in the tree somewhere else under their objects. Yeah, if you could then take this panda node and reparent it somewhere else. You could parent it over here, and the character joint effect would still work. Um, remember I mentioned that as panda traverses the scene graph, when it visits the character node, it computes the joint positions at that time. And that's an optimization because it might be that the character's off screen and you're never even gonna see it. Why bother to compute its joints if you're not gonna see it? Um, which is great, as long as you never need to care about it outside of Panda's rendering loop. But if you actually want to query the, uh, the node's uh, join angle for some reason, it is common, uh, you might want to uh, save its position. You want to you know, put a gun in somebody's hand. Uh, you could just parent the gun to his hand, or um, you maybe want to save that position and uh, do some relative operation on it, something like that. So there are times that you want to query the uh, position of some joint without having rendered the, the character yet. Um, so we used to be, before you had the character joint effect, you'd have to remember to go to the actor and call actor.update, which would force his joints to be computed. The character joint effect makes it happen automatically, that's all. Um, but anyway, I skipped over the add net transform. This is the important magic, uh, which means anytime the character joint gets updated, it computes its transform and stores it on the node that you specify. And that's what makes this node seem to have the same transform of the joint every frame. Um, <laughs> for the record, you could also call add local transform. Joint dot add local transform. This is done less often, but this is the same sort of thing except that it, it uh, copies just the local transform of that particular joint onto the node. By default, we call the net transform because the panda node in question is parented directly to the character. If you had an entire hierarchy of panda nodes that exactly match your hierarchy of joints, um, you could have the local transform on each one, and that would work just as well. Um, it would mean that you would inherit the transforms down the scene graph the same way they inherit them in the, uh, in the joint hierarchy. Um, but because we parent the panda node in question to the character node, it doesn't have any parents below that. We need to imitate the inherited uh, transforms from the joint hierarchy, which means we kept the net transform on the panda node. Does that make sense? So once we've called uh, actor.exposed joint, and therefore join.addNetTransform, we can then treat this panda node 
as if it's the same thing as the joint in terms of parenting things to it or whatever, and the things that we parent to it will just animate as if the joint is animating. Uh, the converse of exposed joint is control joint, and that means that we're creating a panda node that we want to read the transform from every frame. Um, so when you call actor.control joint, again, it does a similar thing. It creates a panda node under the character. Uh, and uh, now it's going to take, it calls some other low level function, uh, which is deep within the bundle. I've changed it recently. I think I would get initial value. Closer. What is it? Get initial value. Get initial, well, that's part of it. Uh, get initial value will, it needs to load uh, the joint's initial transform onto the panda node so that uh, it, no, it doesn't start out identity and immediately wipe the, uh, the join out to identity. But th there's, there's some magic that it does in there which associates the, tells the bundle to associate this node with that join. <coughs> anyway, it's kind of like adnet transform except it goes the other way around. Um, and that tells the joint that every frame you're going to read the animation from this joint transform and apply it to the joint. And therefore, when you uh, set transform on this node or set pause or whatever, it's going to transform the vertices in a similar way. Is there an equivalent uh, for local transform? Yeah, and control? in fact, control joint really is a local transform. So there's a bit of a disparity here. Um, by convention, we expect, when we do an exposed joint, we set the net transform up. When we do a control joint, we're reading the local transform and applying it to the local transform of the... Of the That's uh, how you need control joint. each part of it if you want to have it, or expose each part below it if you want to Yeah, control. right. If, if you want to have a combination exposed and control, uh, situation, you need to have a parent node. One, one thing you could do is you could expose the parent node of your joint and uh, uh, parent your new node to that exposed joint. And then when you do the local transform, uh, you will copy the, you, you'll inherit the transform down the graph. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, it, it's a bit of a confusion. People uh, expect control joint to work exactly the same as, as a exposed joint, and it doesn't quite because of the whole local versus net transform thing. Um, it's minor detail until you actually try to use it. Uh, and it's really hard to describe on a whiteboard exactly what the difference is. Once you try to use it, you'll discover why it doesn't work, and you'll eventually figure it out. Um, but the bottom line is, uh, uh, when, we, uh, when we call exposed joint, we're creating a panda node and applying the transform to the panda node every frame. When we call control joint, we're creating a panda node and reading the transform from the joint every, every frame. Um, Obviously, there are times, different times that each is appropriate. Okay, so I think we've got a really good example for uh, for cannons. Mm -hmm. We had the problem of when we were firing cannonballs, we needed to be able to put a grappling hook on the front of the cannon so that as you move the cannon around, that grappling hook would show up. And so we had to do an exposed joint on the root of the cannon so that you could see where it was turning and then put a, a control joint on top of that so that I think um, you could turn the cannon up and down and that would actually move, but then we have a lot of issues with the whole local transform. Yeah, yeah that's a good, okay. That's a good point. So the reason you want to do a control joint is if you want to animate a character in programmatic control, not using an, a static animation table. Uh, so the cannon is a great example of this. Um, now, uh, our first pass at the cannon involved uh, two different nodes. There was one node for the uh, the uh, cannon barrel and a different node for the cannon turret, and we used uh, you know set pause and set hipper and all that stuff to animate those nodes directly. That works fine. Uh, that's, you know, pandas will go to that sort of thing. The problem is that uh, that means there are multiple geom nodes uh, because each of these is on a separate node, and that's more expensive to render than a single geom node. Um, so we collapsed the cannon into a single actor, um, and then uh, we had an actor, we had the artist create an animated cannon with a joint hierarchy, the same way they would do an animated anything else, and they had the rigging and everything. So we imported the character as an actor instead of as a static model. And then we did a control joint on the joint that controls the, uh, the cannon's animation this way and that way. Um, so the cannon barrel is now uh, just part of a, an actor within a, uh, within a character. All the vertices, both the, the barrel and the frame of the, character of the cannon, are inside the same character, inside the same geom node. Um, but because we did a control joint on the barrel, we can animate that independently of the, uh, of the parts. Blech. Well, that didn't make a lot of sense, but anyway. So the point is that we needed to control joint the character uh, to animate the barrel, and we also needed to expose joint to put stuff in the barrel right here. Um, there's my. 
All right, never mind. Moving on. Uh, let's see. Another fancy thing we did along the same lines of minimizing geom nodes. Uh, one of the things that's important in Panda uh, as, as an optimization is to minimize the number of independent geoms that you've got. And that means the number, minimizing the number of geom nodes. Um, now, if you got, happen to have two different actors, and they happen to be always in the same place, it'd be nice if you could call, well, okay. Uh, Panda's got a, a function called flatten, and we use this a lot for optimization. When you have a great big scene graph and it's got lots of geom nodes underneath it, uh, you can call uh, nodepath.flatten strong, and it'll uh, take all those geom nodes and try to collapse them into as few geom nodes as possible. Ideally, just one. If you've got only, if they've all got the same state and they can be shared in the same table of vertices, um, and that's great for optimization purposes because it means you can render all those vertices in one call instead of n calls, which, uh, when you're on a uh, limited budget of about 300 uh, render calls per frame, makes a big difference. Um, the problem with actor is that each actor has to be its own character, uh, and that means each actor has its own geom nodes. Uh, so you can't take two different actors, at least you couldn't before recently, you couldn't take two different actors and call flat and strong on them and end up with, with just one geom node. Uh, but to get around that problem, we ex uh, extended the uh, functionality so that we can do that. Uh, it's kind of weird, uh, but what you end up with, you suppose you have actor one, which is this node path, and actor two, which is this node path. And suppose they happen to be under the same, uh, same node, so they're both under this common node up here, then maybe it's just render. Now, it's possible to call render.flatten strong, and you end up with something that looks like this. So that actor one and actor two are now referencing the very same panda node, uh, and underneath that panda node they have just one character node and this one common geom <coughs> node. But it just so happens that the original vertices that were in actor one are controlled by uh, actor one's play and stop methods, and the vertices that were in actor two are also in the same geom node, but now they're controlled independently by actor two's play and stop methods. Um, and this is some uh, serious merger going on in internally. Uh, yes. I don't actually think we have support for that low-level pan, that top-level pan node. I think the character, the character maps, but you lose a lot of references to the actor at a high level. We had to treat them to get that stuff to work. We had to actually separate out the actor interface from the character, put the character somewhere, and then flatten those characters together. Really? Uh, it, I think so, because if you try to like flatten two actors together and then try to reparent one, that one may not exist anymore. The the node itself. Oh yeah, you're match. right. Yeah, that's so true. We, we had to do a lot of weird stuff to get that to work. You're right. I, I might have misspoke. So um, the actor, once you call flat and strong, your actor might not be associated with the node in the scene graph anymore. You still got the play and stop methods on it, but you can't call reparent to or uh, hide or anything like that. And that's well, it goes without saying because or it should because obviously if your two actors are sharing the same node, you can no longer operate on them independently in terms of the scene graph operations. Um, the only thing you can still do with them independently is play, stop, and all your normal shuttle uh, animation controls. It's a very good point. Um, still, that may be worthwhile in many cases when we have two actors that we know are always going to be together in the same scene. Uh, for instance, the cannons again. We have a ship with multiple cannons. It's nice to have a bunch of cannons on the ship. You're never going to take one of the cannons away and, and go somewhere else. So you just flatten them all together, and now you can still move your, car your, your cannons and independently, um, but there's only one node between them. That's the idea, anyway. Can that work on avatars? Well, avatars are a bit iffy because you want to be independently controlling your avatars. You want to take avatar.1.hide or reparent to somewhere else or detach or you know, remove node. Um, it can, in principle, work with avatars, but only if your avatars are always going to be moving together. Yeah, that's always going to be on the scene at the same time or not on the scene at the same time. Yeah, it's a one-way operation, so once okay. it's done, yeah. you can't do it. And it, yeah, it is, it is a one-way operation. Now, now, what actually happened in here uh, is we have the character node now, which originally, remember, just has one part bundle. Our new character node has two part bundles. It has the original part bundle from here and the part bundle from here. Um, 
So, and inside the JOM node, we have one JOM vertex data. And that vertex data still has one transform blend table, but now that transform blend table has twice the number of entries. It has all the entries from this transform blend table, plus all the entries from this transform blend table. <coughs> so all the vertices that happen to be, oh, it also copied all the vertices. The vertices that were in here and also the vertices that were in here all got copied together into here. So the vertices that came from this character still have the entries back into the transform blend table associated, uh, uh, and the character joints associated with this bundle. And the vertices that came from this one still have the entries back to the joint bundles from this table. And all that's in one big table now. Still, it's great because now we can compute this one big table. It takes about as much time to compute the animation as it did to compute the original animation, right? It's just a twice as big table. Um, but we can now send all these vertices to the graphics card and Wow, that's great. But it does complicate things. And once you've done this, it is a one-way trip. You're never going back. Um, so you've got to be careful with uh, doing it at the wrong time. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. and. There's, there's one other nicety. Um, we had actor dot press flatten. Just to make things just a little clumsier. If you, once you call flatten strong on a node that includes an actor, you're probably going to want to call post flatten because flatten strong does some weird things in here, and the high level actor class needs to do some stuff to fix up the work that might have been done. Um, this is particularly necessary if your actor happens to have multiple LEDs and merge LED bundle set, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. Um, but if you, if you fail to do this, your actor might stop animating when you call play or whatever like that, and you'll say, why is my actor not working? Um, so just so you know, that's something you need to do. Uh, all right. Uh, right. So let's go back to other kinds of characters, other kinds of actors. I mentioned in passing before that you might have different LEDs on your actor. This is particularly common for avatars. And what this means is you've got an LED node up here, and you've got multiple characters. Typically we have three, but of course you can have any number of LEDs that you want. Um, now, I don't know if you're familiar with the Pandas LED node. This is just a special node that renders exactly one of its children every frame. And the, if the child that decides to render depends on your distance from the camera. Um, so, since in this example, this LED node has three children, it means it's going to render one of these three characters uh, according to the distance from the character. Presumably, you have you know, your low level detail down here and your high level detail up here. And as you get closer, it's going to switch between one and the other. Um, now, actor will set up this structure for you uh, automatically, the actor class. And the way it's normally done is, uh, if in the actor constructor you can pass it to dictionary of models instead of just a single model, and you give each one a name, and it uh, does all the magic, sets up the node, and names all your characters, and then from then on, within your actor, when you call actor.play, it's going to, although it's really got three different characters, when you call actor.play, it's fundamentally going to go into each of one of those and call play on each of the three different LEDs. Um, now, remember I mentioned earlier that when you call animcontrol.play and that character never gets rendered, there's no cost to that to speak of. Um, so it's okay that you got three different characters playing because only the one that actually gets rendered is the one that gets its vertices computed. Um, there is uh, now. That's what well and good. Uh, there's uh, actually a further optimization that you can do. This is. Uh, optional, but uh, in the constructor to the actor, you can pass a parameter called merge LED bundles. If you set that true, then uh, when you when you set up your multiple uh, characters this way, uh, it's going to take all the, uh, the the bundles from each of these three characters, and it's going to combine them into a single bundle, which has the same hierarchy. So this only works if your three different three different LEDs happen to have the same joint hierarchy, which typically they will, if, especially if they're different levels of detail of the same character. Um, remember, we have a, a joint hierarchy, uh, which was the part bundle at the top, uh, part bundle, and underneath there was a table of uh, joints and, and everything and whatnot, and signs and such. Um, so you would have one part, part bundle hierarchy for your high level detail, a different hierarchy for your middle level detail, and a different hierarchy again for your low level detail, because they all came from different egg files. Uh, but 
presumably because they all came out of the same model pie, or, or, or at least at some point originally they had the same joint structure. Um, it's possible to for them all to share the same joint structure, and there are some good reasons that this is an advantage. If nothing else, this is a memory advantage because if you have hundreds of joints, it can be pretty expensive to store all these matrices. Um, but the other advantage is it's a bit of a performance advantage because as you're switching between levels of detail, it doesn't have to recompute the same uh, joint table for each uh, different detail. They're actually all the same joint detail. Um, so anyway, <coughs> merge to LOD bundles is a useful optimization. It does have some funny side effects, um, but in general, you shouldn't notice the effect. Do we switch the characters in the LOD now when we do merge LOD bundles? Do we switch them? Because technically you can just have one character at that point and get rid of the other two. No. And higher up in the chain. How could you do that? Because you still got the different levels of detail. Yeah, but the character is just the part bundle. So once you merge them, they're the exact same part bundle. That's true. Uh, we're doing that the same ships now. Um, well, maybe you could. Uh, you would have to, in that case, you would have to invert the scene graph so that. Let's see, you can do this. You would have your character up here. Then you'd have your LOD node. And then your three different geom nodes. Th this would work in principle. Maybe, it may maybe we're doing this for the ships. Uh, we're going to be, but I, I'm not sure if we should do it for actors. It doesn't look like yeah. a win yeah. necessarily. Right. The fundamental, the actor implementation by itself will not do this. It will leave the characters under the LOD node. Um, but you could do this, and the, the reason you'd want to do, do this is to allow more flattening. If you happen to have more different uh, gem in here, you can flatten together uh, your different uh, levels of detail with more precision. Uh, and we do this on the ships, I think, because we have the mass and the sails all coming from different models. We wanted to flatten them all together under the LOD node. That does, does make a lot of sense. Um, but yeah, th that's a pretty, uh, pretty low level thing that you want to do, and that really is on a case by case basis. Uh, but yeah, the fundamental point is once you've merged your LOD bundles, you've got ba either one character or three characters, it doesn't matter. The, the character is just a node to store the bundle, it doesn't really matter where it is. Um, but the, the, the actual geometry is still the stuff that gets rendered. And the LOD node is a thing that switches between them. So at some point you have to have at least a different geom node for each level of detail. Now, once you've created, let me, let me take a step back to the high level interface. Uh, when you create an actor with multiple levels of detail, um, the actor uh, remembers all your different levels of detail, and most of the uh, operations you can do in an actor have a parameter called LOD name, uh, which most of the time you ignore, because the default is all of them. Uh, but if you really wanted to control just one particular level of detail, you could do that by specifying, specifying the level of detail. Um, and typically you name them, you know, 1,000 or high, medium, low, or whatever like that. Uh, so if you wanted, you could do, you could play one animation on the high level of detail and a different animation on the low level of detail. I don't know if you really want to do that, but it's an option. Um, Can you use that to, like, not play an animation on a low level detail? You could, if you wanted to, but I'm no, I don't know why there would be any advantage to do that. Because if you're never going to render the low level detail, it doesn't really matter. Um, I guess, yeah, maybe there might be some advantage because if you are running a little level of detail, maybe you don't care about his hand animation, maybe you have a, a subtly different animation that shows just the large body animation. But I'm not sure you're buying that much. Um, yeah. And if you just stop the animation altogether, you might get away with it. And again, you're not buying that much. Uh, but yeah, maybe. If you want to get every last bit of uh, microseconds out of your frame time, you, know, you could cheat your animation on a little level detail. Uh, let's see. Alrighty. Another kind of funny actor structure that you might have is the multi-part actor. Uh, let me see. Let me go back to our fundamental actor structure again. Uh, so at the root, well, we have our panda at the top. <coughs> Uh, let's see, when we have a multi-part actor, what this means is we've loaded up uh, different pieces from different egg files 
and we want them to stack together in funny ways to make up a single character. We do this in Toontown uh, to allow you to mix and match uh, legs and torsos and heads. In Toontown, when you make a character, you can have, you know, you can choose from the, the short legs or the long legs or the medium-sized legs. And you can also choose from the medium torso or the short fat torso or the long skinny torso. And you can mix and match these to your heart's content. Of course, there's all sorts of different heads too. You got your cat head and your, your dog head and all, all, all these things can stack up in different ways. Um, because you can mix and match these, the way we do this in Toontown is we actually load up these things from different models and stack them onto the, onto the torso and put them in together. Um, this does have some uh, limitations. It does mean we can't have, for instance, uh, any polygons that straddle between the, uh, the tops of the uh, legs and the bottom of the torso. Uh, they just have to be sitting on top of each other. That's not a real big deal. These are tunes. You can do that. Similarly, for the heads, uh, we can't have a, a neck that's stitched together onto the torso. It's just a pole, and the head just rotates around on the pole. That's okay, too. We're not doing humans here, so it doesn't matter that much. Um, but uh, this creates a hierarchy that looks kind of like this. Uh, we've got the leg node comes up first. The leg is a, is a character, and this is on the bottom of the hierarchy, so it shows up uh, on the top of the hierarchy here. And it's got an exposed joint. The exposed joint happens to be the hip joint, which is the top joint up here. That exposed joint is here, and that has a transform on it, which gets the transform from the hip joint. And parented to that, we have another character, which is the torso. And it's got its geom nodes. <coughs> And it's got its own exposed joint, which is the neck joint. And so this joint is getting the animation from the neck, neck joint every frame. And that mean, and then underneath that, good gosh, we've got another character. And this is the head. And the head's got its geom node. And its geom node is animating. And it's got, well, it doesn't have to have, doesn't have, to have any more exposed joints. That's that. So this is a multi-part actor, and my gosh, this is complicated to set up. You can do it. Uh, it's, uh, this is the only way we mentioned on the man page, on the Panda 3D manual, how to uh, set up uh, multiple animations if you wanted to do it, uh, animate the arms differently from the heads. But there is actually a much better way in the actor class than, than this if you only want to serve, if the only purpose that you want to do this is to have different animations on the torso and the legs. Um, there's a much better way, which I'll talk about in a minute. But uh, this is at least one way to achieve that, but the main reason we do this is to get the interchangeable parts. Um, because clearly you can now switch out the torso without changing too much else with a different torso. Uh, let's see. And it is in, po in fact possible now to play a different animation on the legs than on the uh, arms. For instance, you could have the legs walking along and play a waiting animation on the torso at the same time, and your character may be walking and waiting at the same time. Um, we don't actually do that in Toontown, but we could in principle. Uh, but if you don't specify individual parts, if you just say actor.play, once again, the actor knows it's got all these parts inside of it, and it's going to go and call play on all three of them. And in fact, in Toontown, there's LEDs on top of this. So there's actually nine different characters it has to play when you call tune.play. Um, but the actor can do that. Not so bad. Uh, now, the reason I bring this up first is because uh, when you call actor.play, you get uh, an optional parameter for the part name. If you don't specify a part name parameter, you just play on all parts, and that's the normal default. But when you set up your multiple parts, you give each one a name, and so you, and, and you can for instance, legs, torso, head. Uh, and this is the interface that you can use on, on the high level to play a different animation on the legs and on the head. Um, so you could do actor.play walk, comma, part name equal legs. Uh, and that would just play it on the legs. Isn't that supposed all right. Uh, one more thing I should mention. Uh, if you want to do this, if you really want to do this, one thing that's important to do is to make sure that the animation for the torso doesn't contain any of the animation for the walk animation, because it's going to inherit all that animation from its parent. Right? If you created this actor in uh, Maya or something like that, and you created the torso parented to the legs, um, and the torso is bobbing around doing your walk animation, because that's what torsos do during walk animations, when you parent your torso to the legs, the legs are also bobbing around, so your, act, your torso is going to bob right off of the tops of the legs. Clearly, you need your torso to be fixed in place 
during the walk animation. Now you can have your arms pumping, uh, but the bottom of the torso has to be fixed and rigid to the hip joint because it's the hip joint that's doing that animation. Uh, to facilitate that, we have a program called Egg Top Strip. Egg Top Strip. And the function of Top Strip is to remove the animation off the top joint, and you declare what the top joint is. Uh, we pass the torso through Egg Top Strip, and we say the top joint is whatever the name of the joint is that's on the bottom of the hips. And that strips off all the animation from the, jip, from the uh, hip animation so that we can then parent uh, the uh, torso directly to the hips and it's going to inherit that animation again. Now, we, didn't, we don't have to do that. We could not do the top strip and then not parent them. Instead of doing explosion, we could just leave all the characters up here. And that would work too, except that we wouldn't be able to mix and match. Um, if we played different animations on the different legs, they wouldn't work anymore. Um, so it's better to stack them up and do the top strip to remove the animations. But that's the, re the need for this is one reason why multi-part actors are so complicated. And if you try to do it uh, by hand, you're probably going to get it wrong the first few times. Um, so don't worry too much about how it works because there's a much better way. If your goal is to have a actor who you can call uh, walk on the legs and wave on the arms independently, uh, there is something called the subpart actor interface, which is uh, much easier than the uh, multiport actor interface. But it has a similar interface from a high, po high level point of view. Uh, the way it works is you create your actor normally, you just load up one egg file uh, that contains your entire model, and it's just one piece. Uh, and it looks just like this your character and your job name. Uh, and now you can call actor. Uh, what is it? Uh, make, make, subpart. make subpart. Yeah, actor. Make subpart. And all you give it is a name, any old name you like, and basically a list of joints, and another list of joints, which is optional. The include joints and the exclude joints. <coughs> so you're giving a list of joints by name. This is the, the first one is the most important one. You're saying, I want this joint and this joint and this joint to be part of this new subpart. And it implicitly, when you name a joint, it also names all the joints below that in the hierarchy. So you could say, I want a subpart called legs, and you name whatever your, your hip joint is. And that means that the hip joint and all the joints below, which would pre presumably be all of your legs, are now part of this new legs animation. And this basically creates a part as far as the interface is concerned. And you can call actor.play uh, you know, walk, comma, part name equals legs, if you put in legs here. And only the legs start walking. And it's well. And now we've got an actor that we can control independently, especially if we also do a, a different part for the torso and a different part for the head. As long as we know the joint names that are the roots of each of these pieces, we can now control the joints and the legs and the head independently with different animations. Um, the reason we have a separate parameter for ex exclude joints is if you have uh, something under your hierarchy that you don't want to be part of that thing, you can optionally include those. Uh, for instance, actually, I think in a typical character, um, well, you might, depending on how your hierarchy is structured, uh, you might, for instance, maybe you just want to do your, uh, your left hand and your right hand, but you have another part that you want to be the shoulders. So you can create a shoulders part, but exclude the left and right hands, and then you can create a separate left and right hand part. Um, anyway, you can have different subparts that overlap or don't overlap to varying degrees. If all of your subparts don't overlap and completely define all of your characters, um, then you might want to pass subparts complete. I, I think this is a parameter to the um, actor constructor. Make subparts complete. Yeah, make, oh, yeah, you're right. It's a make subparts complete. And this just means that uh, the only difference, if you call make subparts complete, it means that if you don't specify a part name, um, if you don't call make subparts complete when you call it actor.play and you don't specify a part name, it's going to play it on the root actor, which is a little bit different from playing out at each individual part. If you say make subparts complete and you call actor.play, instead of calling on the root actor, it's going to call it on each individual part. And the main difference is when there's overlap, uh, if you call uh, legs.walk, legs for instance, if you call actor.play walk comma part name equal legs, uh, that's going to stop any other animations that we're playing that overlap with legs at all, in any part of it. 
um, but it won't affect any animation, any uh, parts that don't overlap with the legs. So if you called root name actor dot play a wave, your actor sitting there waving on the whole actor, and then you call uh, part name legs a walk. If uh, you didn't call subparts complete, it's going to stop the top part actor. He's, he's not going to be waving anymore. He's just going to be walking out here. You'd have to call wave on just the part of the actor that wasn't the legs. Um, so that's the purpose of subparts complete. It's a little confusing, uh, but uh, uh, it becomes clear what the uh, intention is when you uh, actually run into this problem. I want to list out a time. Um, so I guess I'll draw the line there. That's, that's most of the high-level interface of actor. There's some fiddly things that uh, uh, are worth mentioning in passing, I guess. Animation blending, if you want to play different animations at the, at the same time, um, which is different from uh, different parts of the animation. If I play, uh, I've been talking about playing one animation on the legs and a different animation on the torso. It's possible to have two animations going on at the same time on the whole actor uh, and different uh, weights of each one contributing. For instance, he could be walking and waving uh, while he's leaning forward. Um, and then that would mean you get 50% of the lean forward and 50% of the wave going on. Um, there's also uh, the ability to uh, do uh, interpolation between frames as the animation goes. By default, uh, when it plays an animation, each frame it holds that animation frame in, for the entire duration of the, uh, the, the frame specification, which is typically 1 24th of a second. Um, if you wanted it to smoothly transition between frames so that it changes between every frame of rendering, uh, that's another blending option. Um, typically we don't do that because uh, the artists don't like the effect that it causes. They animated this thing at 24 frames per second, they want to see it run at 24 frames per second. Also, we don't have a way to specify uh, discontinuities. So if you have a jump cut in your animation, particularly on camera, camera animations, it doesn't look very good when you do that, that lurping because you're going to lurp across that jump. Um, but there, there's a few other fiddly things which are all documented in the actor.py if you want to read about. Uh, yeah, okay. Questions? So the multi-part is really the only way to do um, an actor that you want to, say, swap out the body with different geometry sets um, and have them, I mean, is that the only reason really to have that effectively nowadays, given that the subpart system is Yeah, close? that's the only reason to do that. Uh, so you can mix and match body parts. Um, one advantage of doing the subparts is that you can now have uh, polygons across that scene. You can have a neck that's merely made out of polygons. You can have hips that are connected, uh, which you can't do with the with the multipart animation. With the multipart you have to put things together with no joining. They have to be just interpenetrating. But with the subpart, they can actually be made with polygons that stitched together properly, and it just works. Okay. All right. So, all right. Happy acting. Mm -hmm.